Imagine a place where private ownership of internet routers is deemed illegal, and the only way to get lackluster internet is through one government-run telecommunications company. Imagine having the true history of your country censored, and any deviation from approved thought can get you jailed. Imagine being a citizen of one of the most technologically disadvantaged countries in the world. You may have thought of places like North Korea or Venezuela, but the truth is, this opposition towards the internet is a mere 485 miles away from the U.S. I'm talking about Cuba. It's the country where I was born, and I've been able to bear witness to the evolution of technology on the island over the years. Currently, a Cuban citizen with one month's pay can only afford one hour of internet connectivity. It may be difficult for us to imagine how precious this one hour of internet is to us. Considering our privileged position in, that we have right now, we have unlimited access to the internet throughout our daily lives. But let me put it into perspective. How often do you use the internet in your daily life to complete work or for entertainment purposes? Well, the MIT Technology Review recently released a study that said that Americans, on average, use the internet 24 hours a week. That's three hours a day. Now, for us, this may seem like a trivial amount of time to complete work or to catch up on any shows that you may have missed, but for a Cuban citizen, those three hours are a gold mine. And you also need to compare and contrast the quality of connection as well. The fact of the matter is, one hour of volatile and unreliable internet will never be able to inform one person, let alone an entire country. However, the Cuban people have found a way to circumvent this system of oppression and totalitarianism. It's called El Paquete. Now, what is El Paquete? First of all, El Paquete, translated into English, means the package. And El Paquete is a compilation of games, movies, TV shows, e-books, and magazines to, that we consume on a daily basis that are then provided, then are then given to the Cuban citizens. This is how it all works. First, we need to start at the United States. This is where all the information is primarily gathered. In Florida, which is the main spot of uh, organization, you have the Cuban pirates, as so they're called. The Cuban pirates are the ones that download all this information, these games, these TV shows, movies, and they compile it into a one terabyte folder. Now, for context, one terabyte is uh, about the average size of a home computer. So, these Cuban pirates compile one terabyte's worth, or an entire home's computer's worth, of information. Once all that is done, they send it to the Cuban managers of El Paquete. However, I previously said that private ownership of, or private ownership of internet routers and private access to the internet is illegal for most Cuban citizens. However, the Cuban managers of El Paquete, which are actually stationed in Cuba, have figured out a way to bypass this as well. First and foremost, you need a device that is capable of receiving and sending internet signals. So, what the Cuban managers do is they get a receiver, an, an, an antenna or a satellite dish, and they station it on top of their roof. After all that is done, they also need to make sure that it blends in with the scenery, because obviously, there are Cuban police and Cuban military that patrol the streets trying to find any contraband and trying to confiscate it as well. So, what's the solution? Mo the most reoccurring solution, the one that I have researched the most, is actually hollowed out water barrels. In Cuba, the way that most people actually store their water is through water barrels. So, by hollowing out a water barrel and putting it around a receiver makes it completely inconspicuous to the scenery around it. So, you have the antenna, and you make sure that it blends in with the scenery so that nothing looks suspicious, but you have another problem. How are you actually going to get this connection? Well, the Cuban managers have figured out a way to bypass this as well. Currently in Cuba, the only way to have private internet access in your home is if you are a professional worker or a worker of the government, which can either be an advocate for the Communist Party of Cuba or a doctor or a software engineer that works for a government firm or the government or military hospital. However, this doesn't mean that they're necessarily in a high position and live separately from common people. No. In fact, 
doctors, software engineers, and advocates for the Communist Party of Cuba are actually neighbors and live in the same towns and cities as the Cuba managers of El Paquete. So it's relatively easy to appropriate these government worker credentials and use this hijacked signal to be able to communicate with the United States. So you have everything. You have the antenna, you have the water barrel, and you have the actual connection necessary to communicate with the United States. So what do you do now? Well, you have to download all that information that comes from the Cuban pirates. So again, one terabyte of information is compiled and categorized because El Paquete is actually a business. You're trying to, the Cuban managers are trying to make money off of this. So after this one terabyte's worth of information is downloaded, it is categorized and organized into its specific genre and uh, file folders, and afterwards, it is put onto a one terabyte hard drive. And after it's in that hard drive, they have to station themselves in particular locations that meet two specific criteria. One, they have to be able to avoid the Cuban police or the Cuban military that patrol. And two, they have to be able to station themselves in areas where common people know where to find them. And the place where they station themselves most often is actually alleyways or even in their own homes because it's easier to wrap up whatever they're doing and go back into hiding. So that's how El Paquete works. But some recent, develop, recent developments have actually been incredibly interesting in terms of um, its further development, and that's the economic aspect of it. <clears throat> Currently, uh, El Paquete has been covered as one specific entity, but that's simply an incorrect way of conceptualizing El Paquete. The media often likes to present El Paquete as this one lone entity, trying to battle against the socialist uh, government that's trying to restrict internet and freedom of thought. But in reality, El Paquete are individual people. It's individual businesses that aren't run by any regulations of the government because of its illegality. So, what do you have? You have competition within networks of El Paquete. In, in the beginning, obviously there was a monopoly because there was only one distributor that was able to provide all this information to the Cuban people. But it's been years since the first paquete was ever distributed. So obviously now there are other managers of El Paquete who are able to offer the same information at a lower price. What does that mean? Well, the original distributors and the original managers actually have to figure out a way to make money due to the loss in profits because of competition. So they resorted to a system of commissions and fees. And it's actually similar to a system here in the, in the US that deals with laptop manufacturers, actually. It's, no, it's known as a, a system called bloatware. Now, what is bloatware? Well, think about it like this. When a laptop manufacturer creates their device, they have to go through all the costs and expenses of making that laptop, and then they need to put up a specific price to be able to cover those costs. The problem is, though, they don't want to put an egregious price because then the average consumer isn't going to want to buy it. So first and foremost, they put the price to cover the cost of making that laptop, but they still need to be able to make a profit off of this device. So that's where bloatware comes in. These manufacturing devices contact other software companies and say, hey, uh, if you pay us a certain amount of money, we will put your software into our laptops before our customers buy them so that the first thing you see when you open your shiny new laptop is your program. And this system works. This is actually how the majority of manufacturing companies like Dell and HP actually make the vast majority of their profits. It's the same system with the Cuban managers of El Paquete. The, the main way that they're able to make a profit off of this system is not through selling the actual Paquete, it's actually through the system of commissions and fees of um, having content put on the front page of El Paquete. But there's also another interesting thing about the system of commissions, and that it's primarily used by journalists, specifically anti-Castro and anti-Cuban journalists. But what these journalists want to do, and their main goal, is trying to educate the Cuban people. Because obviously, they're not able to access the plethora of information that there is concerning the Cuban regime and its totalitarian tactics. So these journalists contact the Cuban managers, and they say, hey, I will pay you a certain amount of money to put my article, my newspaper, or this information on the front folders, or you can think about this better, on the front page of El Paquete. So when people download El Paquete, 
they, the first thing that they will see after they've downloaded their specific content that they want, it will be that specific, the specific article or that specific newspaper. But this is really interesting because it deals with the monetization of information. And it really begs the question of whether or not the, real, the information that we consume every day is actually the truth. Because every single day, our, the information that we consume isn't what we would conceptualize as our reality. It's constantly being manipulated by governmental or corporate forces in their favor. So that's something that we all need to consider. But that's how El Paquete works. But let's get into why there's no internet on the island right now. Take a look at this map of Cuba and Venezuela specifically. The green line that connects them is an internet cable known as ALBA-1. Now, ALBA-1 is not a particularly bad internet cable at all. In fact, it's a standard fiber optic internet cable that internet service providers in the US actually use to provide a fast fiber optic connection to consumers. It's often used by companies like Verizon and AT&T, and we use them every day. So the infrastructure is there. There is at least one cable. But what is the Cuban government doing about this? Well, Google was actually in recent negotiations with the Cuban government, trying to push for this infrastructure to be built. And they even offered to build a portion of this infrastructure, free of charge. But the Cuban government said no. But this reaffirms a sad and bleak reality, and it's that totalitarianism is incompatible with free-thinking individuals. The flow of information is what truly liberates people, and this is what drives me. Ever since I learned about the massacres of the Cuban Revolution, I compare and contrast that with the regime of Cuba today, and I continue to remind myself that the only way for people to begin to imagine themselves as being free is when they have the freedom to think. Take a look at this map right here of the internet. This is quite literally the system of cables and servers that connects each and every one of us to each other. Our environment has been designed to keep us informed, and we have the luxury of having at our fingertips the entire world's database of knowledge. I hope no one here has ever been in the position of a Cuban citizen. I hope no one has had to spend an entire month's pay just for one hour of slow internet to be able to contact distant relatives. And once that call is over, reality hits. How are you going to put food on the table? How are you going to provide for your family? I hope I speak for everyone here when I say that I would never give up my current situation for that dystopian nightmare. Thankfully, though, situations in Cuba concerning the internet are actually improving. The recent president, Miguel Diaz Canal, has actually loosened uh, this stance on the internet and also in other fields of science like physics, medicine, and computer science. This has allowed for Cuban and American endeavors in uh, scientific research to actually improve, and there's actually been a lot of good work done so far. In terms of the internet, professional workers, which include doctors or software engineers that work for government firms, actually have access to cellular data on their phones. However, this internet is actually very much filtered, and it's only allowed on a specific network. And on top of that, it only has a 435 megabyte capacity. But this loosening of the, uh, p of the totalitarian position uh, on Cuba on the internet has actually allowed for amazing projects to flourish, uh, just like this one, which I would like to present to all of you here now. And it's called Mata de Guayaba. Mata de Guayaba is a company that I created with my team to be able to push and actually bring open and accessible internet to Cuba. We communicate with families in Miami who have family in Cuba to bring our devices to the Cuban citizens specifically. And once they get those devices, they put their government-issued SIM card into that device, and it turns that government-issued SIM card into a mobile Wi-Fi hotspot that they can use at an unlimited rate for as long as it's connected to power. We know that this is just the beginning, but we hope that further strides in innovation and further pushes in terms of policy for the Cuban government will bring greater accessibility of the internet to the Cuban people. One of our recent prototypes is actually capable of doing such thing, 
and we hope soon to be able to mobilize these products in Cuba. Hopefully now, when you've been on the internet and you've spent an hour doing nothing particularly productive, you can refocus by imagining how precious that one hour of internet really is to a Cuban citizen. I continue to be amazed at the plethora of information that is always, always available at my fingertips. The question is, though, will you do the same? Thank you.